Hey everybody, welcome to Storyline Church Online. I want to give a special welcome to our regular Storyliners. And if you're visiting with us online for the first time, welcome. We want you to feel completely at home with us here while you're in your home. During this physical distancing time, there's no reason why we can't connect spiritually. There's no reason why we can't even through this medium connect in a rich and powerful way through God's Word. So I want to ask you to get a Bible wherever you are, whatever you're doing, just pause, take a little bit of time with me, and let's dive in to very significant principles that I think are going to be a blessing to you. They sure have been a blessing to me. Now, you can chime in at any point along the way in the chat, and we've got some hosts there that are eager to interact with you. So let's just Take the time to flesh out these ideas and banter back and forth, even in our time together in the chat that you will see on whatever platform you are tracking with us. So a few years ago, this, this guy came to me, and I could tell he was pretty heavy. And he said, man, do you have a few minutes? I, I, I need to talk to you, and uh, it's pretty serious. So we went into a room, and we sat down, and he said, he said, my marriage is falling apart. I mean, it's just over. My wife has told me repeatedly, and she just told me again recently with a lot more passion, she said that she doesn't have feelings for me anymore. And he said, the truth is, my feelings for her are pretty much dead too. So, man, it looks like our marriage is over. And then he paused and, and looked at me as if he were waiting for an answer. So I gave him one, but it was not the answer he was expecting. I said, well, I don't think your marriage is over. In fact, I think that if you will do just one thing, just one thing, not only can you save your marriage, but your marriage will flourish and become better than it's ever been before. He said, nah, that's impossible. We just don't have feelings for one another anymore. I said, well, do you want the secret to save your marriage or not. He said, oh man, go ahead, lay it on me. What, what is it? What, how could you possibly? And I said, here's what you're going to do. Read the Song of Solomon in the Bible and do exactly what it says. He laughed out loud. I expected him to laugh out loud. Now, let me just tell you that this was not a unique experience. Over the years, I have encountered this over and over again. I do quite a bit of marriage counseling, premarital counseling, as well as for couples who have already been married for some time and are struggling to survive as a couple. But I've seen over and over again that one of the most common things for people to say is that our marriage is over because we don't have feelings for one another anymore. I don't feel it, therefore it's over. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but our world, our culture, I don't know the exact source of this particular ideology, and I put ideology in quote marks because I'm not sure if it can even be regarded as an ideology. It is, if you think about it, the most idiotic way to live your life imaginable. But here's the philosophy, here's the ideology. If you don't feel it, well then don't do it. Only do what you feel like doing. But if you don't feel it, don't do it. This is a recipe for disaster. And this guy was experiencing it as a recipe for disaster in his marriage. She doesn't have feelings. I don't have feelings. I guess our marriage is over. I said, what you need to do is you need to take the word of God in hand. You need to see what it has to say about marriage. You need to see what it has to say about how a husband is to love his wife, how a husband is to treat his wife. And your wife, I don't know if you could persuade her to take this potential remedy on board, but even if she doesn't participate, I'm putting it on you. Do you want to save your marriage or not? He said, well, I want to save it, but I don't see that there's anything left. I said, listen, if you will read what Scripture says regarding marriage, and you will begin to apply the principles, it is an absolute guarantee that your feelings will begin to catch up with your actions. 
Now, I want to explore this with you from Scripture because at this point in our discussion, the guy said, so you mean to tell me that, that, that I can save my marriage by simply reading some Bible verses and obeying them? I said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. He said, that sounds like mindless legalism to me. I said, well, it's not mindless legalism. It is the most intelligent course that you, who are about to get a divorce, could pursue right now. You have no better plan. You're going to follow your feelings straight into divorce, like many millions before you have. Or you can try my method. See what scripture says about the conduct of a husband toward a wife and do what scripture says. What have you got to lose? He said, well, it just sounds like mindless legalism. I want to make one point absolutely clear. What this guy was saying and what he was thinking, I have to be honest with you, on some level of my own heart, I agree with. As I'm saying these, thing, these things to him, I'm thinking, this sounds pretty strong. This sounds pretty weird. Why am I saying this? Is this really what this guy needs to hear? But I've learned over the years that obedience to God's word is not legalism. It's the farthest thing from legalism. In fact, I would define, I would define obedience like this. Obedience is love-fueled trust. Now think about this for a minute. If God is love, well then it logically follows that God has our best interest at heart. Let me, let me back up, make sure that we catch this. If God is love, if God is fundamentally good, it follows that he only has our best interest at heart. And if God only has our best interest at heart and God is infinitely wise, certainly he knows a thing or two Actually, he knows everything about how relationships are to operate to the best outcome. So the only way obedience to the Lord could be regarded as mindless legalism is if you begin with a premise that God is your enemy, that God doesn't have your best interests at heart, that God is self-serving in some sense. Now, if that's the case, if that's the case, Oh, I would be the first to tell you, don't obey the super intelligent, all-knowing God of the universe because he's a monster who doesn't have your best interests at heart. But if God loves you, and if God only has your best interests at heart, why not do what God says? Now, I'm going to build a case for this, and I am perfectly aware that at this point, whoever you are, for most of you, you're probably thinking, this sounds really weird, this sounds ridiculous. Is this really how this guy should be doing marriage counseling? Well, this particular man was thinking the same thing. When I told him, read what scripture says and do it, he said, well, don't we need marriage counseling? I said, well, you may need marriage counseling. And marriage counseling is a good thing and can be a blessing. But it sounds to me like you have an emergency on your hands. So I'm giving you a shortcut. I'm giving you an opportunity to leapfrog straight over the counseling and to get some traction right now before your marriage ends. Read what scripture says regarding marriage. Begin applying the principles and see what happens. Now regarding this obedience idea, I want you to look with me at Deuteronomy chapter 5. If you have a Bible, just open it to Deuteronomy chapter 5. This is remarkable. Here is the God of the universe. Uh, we're operating on the assumption now, on the premise, that this God is fundamentally good. Now, if you don't believe that God is fundamentally good, if you have a picture of God that puts him in the category of a kind of all-powerful and all-wise and all-knowing monster, well, then you're not going to take too kindly to the way he speaks to you right here. But if you begin with the premise that God is good and only has your best interests at heart, listen carefully to these words. This is Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 29. Oh, that they, this is God speaking to Moses regarding the children of Israel. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me, that is, reverence me with awe, 
and always keep all my commandments. Now watch this, watch this. There's a comma there. Oh, that they had a heart in them to reverence me with awe and always keep all my commandments, comma, watch this, that it might go well with them and with their children forever. Now, the word forever here is a poetic mechanism for the idea of generational blessing. In other words, this text is saying that if you will obey all of my commandments, well, then there will be positive outcomes to you in the present tense, but those positive outcomes will be residual. They will be generational. Your children, your grandchildren will receive the blessing of the application of these principles. Now, in the text, God is saying, if you'll do what I'm telling you, my promise to you is that it will go well with you. In other words, you will flourish, you will thrive, you will experience positive outcomes, quality of life will increase, you will prosper and be successful in what you apply your life to when these principles are at the center of your life. Now check this out, skipping uh, down to verse 32, notice this, therefore you shall be careful to do, I'm emphasizing the word do, you'll see why in a minute, you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you, you shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. So, so God's principles, God's commands are before you. Just keep your eye on what God has said. Do what God has said, be careful to do what God has said, notice this, and don't turn to the right or to the left, and watch this, verse 33, you shall walk in all the ways, the patterns, the habit patterns, all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that, so that, in order that, there's a cause, there's an effect, do this and something will follow, that you may live, that you may live, and that you, that it may be well with you, Again, like verse 29, repeating the idea that there is a kind of wellness, flourishing, thriving, prosperity that is inherent in God's commands, in God's word. Now again, we need to make clear that what we're talking about here is not mindless legalism. This is not a form of slavery any more than, let me give you an illustration. It's a pretty lame illustration, but it'll make the point. Here's the illustration. I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine that you have a friend, you have a friend that is twice your size in body mass and has double your IQ. He's super smart and he's a super strong and powerful. And let's just say that you are in some kind of predicament that is threatening to take your life. You're in a building that is under attack by some kind of menacing individuals who are surrounding the building with firearms and they're coming in to get you guys. Now there you are, you're this puny little fellow with an IQ that's nothing really to speak of, you're of average intelligence, and then you have this massive friend who's twice your size, who has double your IQ. This guy is smart in the extreme. Who are you gonna let hatch the plan to get out of the predicament? You're surrounded. Who are you going to follow? Are you going to follow your own plan, or are you gonna follow the plan of your super smart friend who says, I know what we ought to do to get out of this predicament. Here I'm faced with a guy and often faced with people in marriage counseling situations in which they are saying our marriage is falling apart. We don't have feelings for any, uh, one another anymore. And they're wondering what they ought to do. Now I don't happen to be twice their size and I don't happen to be twice their intelligence, but I have a secret weapon. <laughs> I have in my possession a book of principles, laws of life that produce wellness when applied 
to the circumstances of life. When those principles are applied to a predicament, the predicament is resolved or at least seriously mitigated by the application of those principles. The universe is governed by a God who is more than twice our size. He is massive in every way imaginable. And to say God is a genius or more intelligent than us is an understatement. And if you add to God's massive intelligence the fact that God is intrinsically good and only has your best interest at heart, why wouldn't you want to know what God says and do it? The text of scripture that we read, God says, I wish they would just do what I'm telling them to do. Because if they would do what I'm telling them to do, they would live, they would flourish. Now, I find it interesting that science, from my observation over the years, is always catching up with scripture. I wanna say that again for emphasis because I know it sounds crazy, but I wanna show you something. Science is always in the process of catching up with scripture when it is objective in reporting its findings without any kind of bias to mix up the data. But if you just pay attention to the way reality operates, the way things are, the intrinsic nature of things which science purports to observe, over and over again you will discover that what scripture teaches is true and in our best interest. So I was not surprised when I came across this Psychology Today article from 2010 with this very provocative title, Action, cre action Creates Emotion. Action Creates Emotion. Here's the subtitle of the article. Want to change how you're feeling? Question mark. Change what you're doing. Want to change what you're feeling? Change what you're doing. Now, the doctor, the PhD, the super intelligent scientific mind who is reporting to us is Noam Spencer, I guess is how you would pronounce his name, and this is what he says to conclude all of the science that he has reported to us in the previous paragraphs of the article. Watch this. He says, in closing his article, the shortest, most reliable way to change how you're feeling is to change what you're doing. The shortest, most reliable way to change how you're feeling is to change what you're doing. And then he says this, when you feel bad, don't wait to feel good. Don't wait to feel good to do what you love. Start doing what you love and good feelings will likely follow. This is fascinating. What the article is essentially saying to us is that feelings follow wherever actions lead. We live in a world and a culture that is feelings obsessed. So obsessed with our feelings, in fact, that one couple after another, even during this very difficult time of physical distancing when people are spending more time with one another than they have spent with one another in years, we're told that divorce rates are skyrocketing and domestic abuse is being reported at a higher rate than any time in recent memory. Well, if we're going to follow our feelings, we're going to follow our feelings right out of relationships with people, right out of relationships with our wives and husbands, right out of relationships with our children, out of relationships with our friends. What I'm suggesting to you is that actions of love will produce feelings of love. If you begin to act in accordance with what you know to be the best course of action, sure enough, your feelings will begin to catch up with your actions. This is 
the principle that is articulated in Scripture when God comes along and he says, listen, what I want you to do is apply my principles as a kind of experiment, if you will, in life. I mean, I know you might not trust me. You might not feel like doing this. But God seems to be saying that our lives can be a kind of experimental laboratory in which we apply his principles to our lives and we watch and see the outcomes. This brother came to me about a year after our interaction and he said, you're not going to believe what happened. And I'm saying in my mind, I think I have a hunch what happened. He said, I thought it was crazy what you were telling me. But I went home and I began reading the Song of Solomon and he said it's, it's pretty mushy, it's pretty emotional, it's pretty romantic. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I don't understand in the poetry. It's, it's beautiful, I guess. I'm not that kind of guy, he said. But I knew enough to begin manifesting affection to my wife, to begin holding her hand and taking her out on dates again and eating dinner with her rather than quickly scarfing down food at the counter and then taking off. I began to look into her eyes. I began to listen to her. I began to empathize with her feelings and to hear what she had to say. And he told me, man, we have fallen in love all over again. Not only is our marriage saved, our marriage is better than it's ever been. And this, my friends, is what C.S. Lewis calls one of the great secrets of life. One of the great, how would you like to learn right now one of the great secrets of life? Well, we've already articulated it, but C.S. Lewis, in his own way, articulates the secret like this. He says, don't waste your time bothering with whether you love your neighbor or not. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets, one of the great secrets of life. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love them. Isn't that incredible? If you begin to act out the principles of love, even against your natural inclinations in the moment, if you begin to act as if you loved your neighbor, Lewis says, you will discover that your feelings will catch up with your actions. So my appeal to you is a very simple appeal. It might sound at first consideration like mindless legalism, but I'm not asking you to believe everything that I'm saying to you right now. I'm asking you to experiment with it. I'm asking you to just give the Lord a try. And my challenge to you is simply this. Trust the God of the universe and to do what he says. Begin to live out the principles of his word, not as a means of gaining God's favor or earning salvation, but because you already have God's favor, he has already put upon you the blessing of his acceptance. If you have come to know that God is good and God loves you, why not do what he says? Why not, why not, Trust the Lord and do what he says and watch your life begin to flourish in ways you never thought possible. Thanks for taking this time to worship with us online. I look forward to connecting with you again next week at the same time. Hey, thanks so much for watching. We hope that message was a blessing to you. God's word is powerful. It penetrates into our minds, into our hearts, brings about transformation in every aspect of our lives. 
Listen, we don't want you to miss any content. So again, we want to encourage you to click on subscribe and track with the content that's going to be coming out week after week. And if you'd like to partner with us in this global ministry of taking the gospel of Christ to the whole world, we want to invite you to become a partner in this ministry. Click give and join with us.